Now, Low Country Forever, a public affairs presentation of the Charleston Radio Group. Welcome to Low Country Forever. I'm Brian Cleary. We're talking about things that matter to you right here in the Low Country. And we're talking with the people who are making a difference in our community. This morning, that would be Charleston's Poet Laureate and also an artist in residence at the Charleston Gilliard Center. We say hello to Marcus Amaker. Thank you for um, sharing this moment with me. It's a big program that the Gilliard Center has introduced, and you and the Grammy Award-winning uh, musician Charlton Singleton are at the forefront of Raising the Volume. How would you explain this to people who haven't heard about this program? Raising the Volume is simply a conversation, and it's simply an opportunity for people to listen to folks who are in town who are making an impact in our community. And it might not be people that you are super uh, uh, familiar with, but it's definitely you know people who I think who are working behind the scenes, who are making things happen. It's, it's also not taking itself too, too seriously. Um, I also think that it's important that we fo- focus on joy, focus on all of the good things that are going on in our city and in our community. So being that Charlton and I have a platform, you know, we are able to use this platform to amplify some voices that I think need to be heard. The word that you said that jumped out to me immediately after conversation was listen. Because it Mm -hmm. seems that that's the challenge. Everybody has something to say, but we don't seem to want to listen to what somebody else wants to tell us. Yeah, and I think that in this world where the media is telling us that um, we are a divided country, actually a lot more people are listening than we think. So um, it is just an opportunity for us to just sit down and listen. It's a conversation. Um, I really think on a larger scale, um, if anybody watches uh, the David Letterman interviews on Netflix, it's sort of like that. And I think that there is a power into just sitting and listening to somebody's story. It sort of breaks the veil or brings down the veil um, a little bit because we're all part of our own marketing team or marketing team. you know, plan. Um, but it's nice to really just sit and have a camera on somebody and hear them talk about their their story. And Charlton and I are really good con- conversationalists. You know, I used to work at Post and Courier, so I have a journalist background. So I really love asking questions and listening to people as they speak about what inspires them and what keeps them going. Let's talk about some of the people who are part of raising the volume, because you said it may not be a name that I immediately recognize, but I think that's important and a good thing because a lot of times what happens in our communities and things that get done are people who are under the radar. They're not the politicians and whatever. So how did you and Charlton go through and decide, here's who we need to talk to with this program? What I love about working with the G- Gilliard is that it's they've given us creative freedom to figure out who we want to talk to, you know? So the stage is really wonderful. There's cameras on us. Um, my microphones are on. And I just, when I think about it, I think about, okay, who are those people who have inspired me? And honestly, it's a, it's an excuse for me to um, hang out with people during this weird uh, quarantine time. So one of the things that I really wanted to do was highlight the voices of black, black women um, who are in this city who are doing a lot of wonderful things. So I interviewed uh, L- LaVonda Brown, who's with the YWCA. And LaVonda has been doing a lot of work for a lot of different people in town. They actually do a a racial equity institute program where they bring in p- people from all parts of the c- country to uh, teach sort of a lesson and teach a class about race history in our country. And I just think it's really important stuff and it's really p- powerful that that's ha- happening here in Charleston. And plus talking to her, I found out all types of things. I found out that she's a big country m- music fan. She loves Blake Shelton. Like, You know, so it's just it's really interesting to hear those conversations. I'm actually going to be talking to Andrea Davis as well. She started a company where she she makes a lot of soaps um, and natural skin products for a lot of folks. So. um, So, yeah, it's that varied. I mean, it's somebody who's, you know, leading a nonprofit, somebody who's making soaps. 
Charlton has talked to College of Charleston teachers and all types of things. So there's a wide variety of people who are on this. This is Low Country Forever. I'm Brian Cleary talking with Marcus Amaker, who is an artist in residence, Charleston's Poet Laureate. We're talking about the Raising the Volume program that's going on at the Gilliard Center. Now, you've released so far three episodes, and these are 30 to 45-minute conversations. The first one, Marcus, was you and Charlton. Talk a little bit about, about episode number one in Raising the Volume. Yeah, that was a lot of fun because I've known Charlton for probably 282 years. Uh, so we've been friends for a long time. And we are definitely in tune with each other energetically as well as just like musically and all that. So Charlton and I just sat and talked and we talked about music. Uh, We talked about our lives. We talked about social justice issues as well. So that was really kind of cool, I think, for people to see behind the scenes, quote unquote, about um, what makes him tick and what things are what things that he labels as like passionate for his life, you know. That one was was a lot of fun. We we both share a deep love of Prince, so that mm. creeps into a lot of the conversation. But also, that was filmed in the middle of a lot of interesting times in our country and in our city. That was filmed right before the Calhoun statue came down. Um, so we talk about that, and you know, we obviously t- talk about the Grammy. We t- we, t- we um, I I read a poem. He played his horn a little bit. That was really cool. And for me, it's a really great opportunity to have like a moment in time that's captured on video. Um, One of the great things about quarantine, I guess, is just, you know, we're more aware of keeping these moments on video so we can reference them later. I've had a lot of conversations with Charlton in the past that have never been filmed, you know, Mm. so this is nice. 50 years from now, I could look, look back on this and be like, wow, you know, I looked better. And um, here is a conversation that, that we had, and it was great. So how about we take this kind of head on, because this is a, a program that you're doing through the Gilliard Center, Raising the Volume. It's described as a conversation on music, race, art, activism, and community in these challenging times that we're in right now with one another. This isn't a program, and explain how it's not, because you, I know you take things from a very positive angle and always try to push that. But this isn't something for black people. It's not for white people. It's not just for women. It's not just for men. It's not just for Hispanics. We could run through the entire list. This is to get the conversation going with the entire community, correct? Yes. But even with that, though, it is okay to say that it is for black people. You know, it is okay to say that it is for everyone. Um, I think that there are going to be things that some people relate to and some people don't. Again, I think it's simply a conversation. When we approach somebody and talk about what the work that they're doing, you know, this work might not relate to you particularly, mm-hmm. but it is something that you can at least learn from, you know, and, and listen to. So I think that it is okay if we did stuff that was just for black folks, you know, but that's not, that's not my energy um, with this. I think that it is important to normalize conversations with women, with black women in particular, because there's so much joy in the black community. And so many times with issues or programs like this, there's so much focus on the trauma. Mm -hmm. Um, But I'm not, I'm not trying to focus on trauma. I'm just trying to focus on, you know, the whole conversation, you know, the whole us as whole people. And and I don't think that the media really focuses on that, particularly with black folks. I don't think that it really focuses on that. For example, you know, I write a lot of different types of poems, but I've been labeled, you know, the social justice poet. But I also have written a lot of poems about Star Wars. You know, I've written <laughs> right. a lot of poems about a lot of different things. So it's just it's unfortunate we have to do work like this to remind people that we are whole people and not just people who internalize and make art out of trauma. <laughs> we are joyful people. Raising the Volume is the, is the program. So we've got three episodes thus far, you and Charlton, uh, the uh, second one that you referenced with you talking to the executive director of uh, the YWCA, LaVonda Brown. There's also episode number two with Judge uh, Arthur McFarlane. Now, was that one that Charlton would have done then? And, and is that how the program works? You guys kind of alternate? Yeah, and... What's awesome is that he has so many connections that I don't, and I have so many connections that he doesn't, you know? 
so it's so it's been really nice just to see who he brings to uh, the stage. Um, I know for me, it's important to have some younger, you know, vo- voices, some queer voices, transgender voices on this stage as well. So that's important to me. So that's going to be a focus of mine moving moving forward. But but yeah, we the way that it goes, it's literally an email. You know, Tr- Charlton will say, "Oh hey, I've got." this person, I'm like, cool. So I'm going to get this, this person. And and I think that if you watch them all, it'll all sort of flow well together because of Charlton and I, because of our styles, you know, we have, we have a certain style about us. And I think that that will tie it all together. So people can go to gilliardstandard.org and see the first three episodes, and then you'll be releasing, do you have any idea what uh, will be part of the second batch of Raising the Volume? It's all about scheduling, so I don't know exactly right now, so it's just figuring out everybody's schedule. Sure. Um, but yeah, but that stuff will will be out. I know we're, we're going to be filming some stuff in the next few weeks or so, so um, you know that stuff will be, as soon as it's finished, it'll be... Uh, released on their website and on their YouTube page. So. And, and as with everything the Gilliard Center does, there's an educational component of this, and there's ways that you're making and breaking it down for middle school teachers and high school teachers. Can you talk a little bit about what will be going on with that? And to be to be honest, I wouldn't be involved with this if there wasn't an education component to it. I think that that's the most important part of this. So as the artist in residence here, I'm tasked with going into schools and doing poetry workshops and having conversations with students. So uh, the Gilliard's going to be using some of the points from our conversations and bringing that into schools in a virtual setting. And so that is the part that is the most important thing to me, that that keeps happening. Um, Just having, I think for a young person to have the access to people in the city who are, quote unquote, you know, make, making change in the city. I think that that's the most important part to me. So that's always in the back of my mind because, um, again, referencing Star Wars, uh, you know, when when Yoda was like, you know, pass on what you've learned. I mean, that's that's the thing that drives 98% of my art is being able to pass on what I've learned and to be able to make sure that it has a life to it and people can be better and do better than than what I'm doing. And it'll just elevate consciousness, I think. So I was going to ask you what your hope is for the program, but it sounds like you just kind of laid that out, that this educational point and moving people forward and just bringing everyone into the conversation. And also it's important for me just to normalize Black life. Again, I think a big thing for me, and this is something that's fresh with me right now is just how so much of our experience is trauma when people talk about the black experience, but there's so much joy too. So it's just highlighting the joy and making sure pe- people realize that we are whole. <laughs> we aren't just, you know, I'm, I'm not just sitting at home writing social justice poems and Charlton's not just doing jazz songs that speak about the Gullah experience. There's so much more to us. And we're going to see that depth as these interviews roll out over the next few weeks and months, I'm sure. Yeah, I hope so. (laughs) The program is Raising the Volume. You can check it out online now at gilliardcenter.org. And this is just a project that you and Charlton look to continue into the future, correct? Yeah, I definitely committed to doing it. You know, this year has definitely provided a lot of challenges Mm -hmm. for, for artists. So my definition is artists in residence um, here has really shifted and changed, but um, you know I can I can improvise, and it's been really nice. I'm still doing a whole bunch of virtual school wor- workshops, but this is really nice to add to the repertoire, I guess. He's Charleston's poet laureate, and he's an artist in resident at the Charleston Gilliard Center. Marcus Amaker talking about the new program, raising the volume at the Gilliard Center. You can watch the first interviews now at GilliardCenter.org. The Charleston Radio Group is the Low Country. Every week, we highlight local organizations and events that are helping to make a difference here where we live. If you have a group, event, or an idea to feature on Low Country Forever, let us know. Visit LowCountryForever.com and click on our podcast link for contact information. Now, Low Country Forever continues.
Welcome to Low Country Forever. We're talking about things important right here in the Low Country and talking to the folks that are making a difference. And this morning, that would include Pam Hartley. Pam, normally this time of the year, not that it's not busy for you now, but we're gearing up for a couple of days before Thanksgiving to have hundreds and hundreds of volunteers at the convention center in North Charleston for the Charleston Basket Brigade. But this little COVID thing has uh, put a little road bump into that, hasn't it? Yeah, it really has. Unfortunately, several months ago, we had to kind of make the tough call. It's the first year, be our 13th Thanksgiving, that we haven't been able to assemble a large group of people and volunteers, loving volunteers in this community, to make our effort happen. The Tuesday before Thanksgiving, we typically have, I would say, a thousand, if not more, people that come down to assemble our meals put them out on pallets, bring them out to the back, families and and large truckloads of people that come through to get maps for delivery and get our boxes loaded up in their cars and SUVs and trucks. And they deliver those that whole Tuesday before Thanksgiving directly to the doors of our recipient families. And this year we just couldn't figure out a way to make that happen safely with COVID Um, and also thinking about, you know, the families that actually deliver directly to the family. So that was a big challenge for us this year. So we had to rethink our effort this year, which was disappointing to us because the spirit of what we do is so alive with our assembly and delivery day, the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. But we think this year we came up with a, a system that works for our families and for all the safety concerns of our community at large. Well, let's take a step back for a second and go back to 2008 for somebody listening who may not be all that familiar with the Charleston Basket Brigade. Uh, talk about how this came about and got us to where we are today. Well, in 2008, I moved to Charleston from Savannah and my good friend, Michelle Scarfile Wallace, she's married now. She reached out to me and said, hey, do you want to feed some families um, and create our own Charleston Basket Brigade? We had met a few years prior at a Tony Robbins event and Tony Robbins Foundation has an international basket brigade. And so we decided to create our own version of that, which is very different from what they do right here in the low country. So that year, you know, there was a a lot of hurt going on with the recession at the time. There were a lot of families that were in need. And I said, sure, let's do it. So she and I came together and literally put together a list of things, reached out to our friends and family and said, hey, would you guys help us do this? And I think we fed, I don't remember the number, it might've been 75 families that first year, which is she and I just kind of winging it. And over the years, boy, it has grown to a full-fledged community event that so many people, thousands and thousands of people over the years have contributed financially. They've contributed their time. They've contributed their spirit and uh, shared things for us, publicized for us. The media has been so kind to us. So many different uh, entities and individuals have come together as a community to serve families in need right here in the low country every year. So I want to say for the past, I don't know, maybe it's been eight years You know, we've been feeding in excess of 20,000 people at Thanksgiving as a community through the Charleston Basket Brigade. And it says a lot that there's going to be a number of people disappointed this year, not in that we're not going to be able to fulfill those meals, but those folks who look forward to coming down to the convention center that Tuesday and being a part of the community that puts this all together. And I feel for each of them because I feel it too. Sure. It's like, it's that day is so filled with gratitude. I'm always so overcome by so many different walks of life that come out, companies, schools, a mom and her two kids, you know, so many different people come out and uh, participate for the first year and many for year after year after year. And it's part of a family tradition and it's the way they give back to the community. And unfortunately, that opportunity isn't going to be there this year. And I am just as saddened by it as our community is. And I hope everybody understands that if we could have figured out a way to do it, we would have. But this year, it's going to look a little different and feel a little different, but everybody can be a part of it in a different way. And to know that our families that really, really need our support right now are going to continue to receive it in an abbreviated way 
but that we are going to still be able to serve them on Thanksgiving. We're talking with Pam Hartley on Low Country Forever. She's with the Charleston Basket Brigade, and obviously COVID-19 has created so many issues for events and things like this. But, Pam, it's also created even more of a need. So it's really important that we get people to step up and help out so we can still feed all those families this Thanksgiving. This year, what we decided to do, because we just, every year we raise about $120,000 to do the full-fledged Thanksgiving meal for families. And this year, our primary partner in fundraising, Carolina One Real Estate, they came to us and they said, we're really concerned. We don't know if we can raise this level of, of donations because they typically do a lot of fundraising events. Right. And then we have partners in the community and businesses that do like the Coastal Cupboard does a knife sharpening event every year. And that they aren't able to do that this year because of COVID. So what we decided to do is we felt like $120,000 was more than what we could raise. We were just really concerned about that. And so I said, you know, if we can at least give those families a 12 to 14 pound turkey, like give them the base of that meal. If that's the one thing that we can do and do it safely, then all we need to raise is about $63,000. Our turkeys are the largest expense that we have every year. Sure. So we came together with communities and schools who finds all of our families, their families they serve within the school districts throughout the Tri-County area. And we have a lot of churches. And I mean, I've got an entire list of AME churches, disability groups, healing groups, so many organizations in this community receive meals from what we're doing that, I mean, the tentacles are very uh, expanded and they reach into all these tiny little areas. So what we did is we created a distribution voucher system. So we're providing gift cards for a free turkey at Low Country Grocers Piggly Wiggly. Um, there are four locations that are in our Tri-County area. And so we drilled down the list. Like literally, if a family lives closer to the North Charleston store, they're getting a voucher from that store. If wow. they live closer to the Somerville store, they're getting a voucher from that store. We literally printed up all these vouchers, distributed all of those to our families that received meals last year. And we have a lot of organizations that will be picking up 75 turkeys one day, 50 organ 50 turkeys another day, and then distributing those through their churches and their organizations as well. Ultimately, is it about 3,500 turkeys that you're looking to get have this year? Yeah, we're doing exactly 3,500 turkeys, actually. We reached out I and mean, we started reaching out to families and to organizations, I want to say two to three months ago, and saying, hey, here's what we're doing this year. Do you want to receive a turkey? And it was an overwhelming, yes, we need it. I want to say back it was probably in the summer. Mm -hmm. um, I got a call from communities and schools and they said, wow, we've got so many families in need. Imagine a charity organization that is inside the schools that knows the families and provides backpack meals at schools and things like that. And they're like, a lot of these families have been displaced from their homes. They need rent. They need, they need so much more support. And so the Basket Brigade was, we were able to give them a grant, a $5,000 grant to wow. help feed people even the summer. And so what's really great about our effort is, yes, we're providing Thanksgiving turkeys to everybody this year. The Piggly Wiggly, the Low Country Grocers Piggly Wiggly, they had a two-month campaign. Um, they just ended, and they raised $8,500 at a roundup, your change, at the cash register sure. campaign. Mm -hmm. And that $8,500, we're going to distribute in $100 and $200 gift cards to communities and schools, families for groceries throughout the holidays. So there is an additional level of support that we're able to do this year for families. So that means so much to us because our effort is about a full-fledged meal at Thanksgiving. And this year, although we're just doing turkeys, we're also able, through this fundraising effort we did with Low Country Grocers Piggly Wiggly, to provide full meals as well beyond the basket brigade when people need it so badly right now. We're talking with Pam Hartley from the Charleston basket brigade on low country forever. So Pam, for someone listening, because you still have a need, what is it that can yeah. I, I can do to help you as you go to finish up the program here for this Thanksgiving? What we're really in need of this year is first and foremost, best wishes and prayers for Thanksgiving for all these families that are truly in need here. Secondly, if you feel called to go to our website, charlestonbasketbrigade.com, click on the donate button 
and donate $30, $60, any denomination, 100% of what you donate is going to go towards fulfilling these needs for turkeys this year. Um, it's been a tight year on fundraising for so many reasons, as you can imagine, but that doesn't mean the need isn't still there. We just ask if, if anybody out there that's listening uh, feels like they want to do that and that's something that they're called to do, we just ask them to go to our website, spread the word with your friends and family to help us reach our goal of $63,000 to be raised within the next couple of weeks leading up to Thanksgiving. And I can't imagine that 12 years ago, although I'm sure it would have been your hope, but that you could have imagined that over that period of time, you've been able to grow this program and feed and impact so many people, not only folks that have received the meals, but all the outpouring of the volunteers that you've been able to bring together in the low country. That's got to be a great feeling. You know, it is. And I'm going to tell you this much. Years ago, Michelle and I realized that our platform is more than just feeding families. It is, it is uh, extending gratitude and it gives people the opportunity to give thanks and to feel gratitude at this time of the year at a different level. And I can tell you, for me personally, and I know for Michelle, I speak for her as well, and anybody who's been involved in the Basket Brigade, there's good in the world. There is good in our community. When you have these firsthand examples of how people raise money and they, they give of their time and their, and their spirit, even today in a world that's in such disarray, the Basket Brigade is such an amazing space of contribution and gratitude and really the heart of what humanity is. And I feel really blessed to have this charity in my life. And I think everybody who comes in contact with it feels the same way for that reason. It gives us all an opportunity to say, hey, there's good in the world still. We're a community and we're united for our community. We're all together in this effort to support one another. And that's really what the spirit of the Basket Brigade and what our effort is every single year. So I invite anybody out there to be a part of it. And next year, God willing, we'll no, be no, back it's, at the convention center. It's Come going to happen. <laughs> it will definitely happen. Yeah. And that's got to be a, a thing because having been down there and see the, the news stories and the photos, it's just a massive humanity in there. You've got young, old, white, black. I mean, you just see the low country pretty much laid out for us right there, all coming together. And, 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 and you talk about that feeling that you have to have. It's a feeling that everyone seems to share in that room at that time. I know. And it really just kind of brings you back to center. What's important in life? It's giving to the people around us. It's making sure our community is fed. It's doing something for someone else, extending yourself beyond yourself. And people in this community embrace that. I mean, Charleston is the most giving community I've ever experienced. And I've lived in other places. And I just love the spirit of all walks of life. And like you say, there is no racial divide. There is no division in politics. There's none of that that exists when we come together in a united effort to really make magic happen in our community, and we all feel it. And you folks who are listening can help that magic continue even this year. Uh, Pam, one more time, you want to give that web address where people can go, and if they uh, have, if they can this year, make a donation to help. CharlestonBasketBrigade.com. And you just click on the donate button. It's a, you can use PayPal. You can enter your credit card. It's a secured site. So your donation would be greatly appreciated. And when you sit down at Thanksgiving this year, like we all do every year, I just always say, wow, how many people are eating this year? How many people are eating today as a result of our community? And you can be a part of that too. I wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving. And I hope the true love and spirit of the holiday is with you on Thanksgiving and always, because there's always an opportunity to serve other people every day of the year. I hope we all embrace that even more as a community coming out of COVID and all the unrest that's in the world yeah, right now, seriously. that we all stay united um, in that effort, one another. 
Again, the web address is charlestonbasketbrigade.com if you'd like to make a donation to this year's program. Pam Hartley, the founder of the Charleston Basket Brigade, our guest on Low Country Forever. Thanks for listening to Low Country Forever. If you missed any of this week's show, there's a complete recording under the podcast link at lowcountryforever.com. Low Country Forever is a public affairs presentation of the Charleston Radio Group.